Um, uh, North Wales Butterflies, uh, presented by Jan Miller. Uh, Jan um, is the county butterfly recorder uh, for Denbyshire and Flintshire, and has been for a few years now, uh, and is really keen for people to look out for butterflies and to identify them. Good reason for coming on this uh, talk today. Uh, and then to send in records, uh, really keen. A really important part of conservation is having, having knowing where butterflies are uh, in various the various vice counties. Okay, but she had a real passion for butterflies and all wildlife really um, for many many years. And has championed uh, their recognition uh, and conservation uh, in uh, many many activities over that time. Uh, she set up stalls at uh, fairs and whatever, kind of promoting butterflies and, and moths as well. Uh, engaged in uh, community activities uh, with, uh, with lots of different parts of North Wales and in schools. Um, created butterfly gardens. We heard John talking a little bit about that before. If you were here then, created butterfly gardens in various places. Um, given talks like this, identification uh, training courses. And it's hard, it's hard to list them all, really. Um, but she's also an author, uh, a writer, um, written a book about wildlife gardening and other of her passions. Um, it's a practical guide to how to create your own wildlife garden. Highly recommend it. Uh, we've got a copy here, a nice big book. Okay, if, I'm sure, sure she'll show you herself too. Um, uh, and she created a, uh, the, the, a chart, which again, she'll talk about later. Um, uh, of identification for the North Wales butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's going to do this stuff. There you go. Um, and all this uh, whilst um, uh, running a business, really, propagating plants uh, uh, and, and selling plants uh, from a home um, not just near Hollywell. Um, but uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Jan. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. I want to get a, but, oh, how do I do the next slide now? There we are. Well, it's just a bit about me with um, website address and things. I'm also on the Welsh Government Pollinator Task Force. And um, so I've got, I'm much more interested in bees, and solitary bees, not honey bees, solitary bees um, in the last few years. So I do quite a bit about that now. So, um, as Mark was saying, that the whole reason for doing this is to try and get people interested in recognising butterflies well enough so that they can send records in to us. And um, this is really important in our conservation efforts um, because they've been dying out since the war. I'm sure you've heard the story before. Um, there are some now 55 to 60 butterflies native in Britain today depending which book who you you read um some with global warming are, are now breeding here like the red admiral that didn't used to so the number changes a little um but over half of these are threatened and five species became extinct in the 20th century um let's go to the next slide so only 34 species remain in north wales and Cheshire. And again, over half of these are threatened. So why has this happened? I'm sure you've heard the story before. They used to say it's mainly loss of habitat and that was due to intensification of agriculture and building after World War II, when of course the government had to encourage farmers to produce more food and to rehouse thousands. But now we've got the added um, problem of climate change and also the use of um, blanket insecticides like neonicotinoids, which we thought, you know, in the 60s we had left, we realised the problems of DDT and that was quickly banned, or maybe not so quickly, but it was. And um, we thought we had got away from that, but I'm afraid we're still using a lot of um, very severe insecticides, which may be partly due to the recent accelerated decline of bees and butterflies and all pollinators. I was just saying, I went to a school the other day and I was just trying to make it, uh, you know, a, 
sort of something that they could recognize and I was saying you know when I was a little girl in the 1950s and early 60s we used to drive across Europe every year to go to Austria because my father was from Vienna and we used to go and visit his family and every time we stopped at a garage for petrol two kids ran out with a bucket of hot soapy water and one of those rubber squeegee things to scrape all the insects off the windscreen because you literally could not see anymore through the windscreen it was completely splattered with yellow gunk from insects smacking into the car as you moved um, but that doesn't happen anymore and that hasn't happened for a long long time i mean i lived in the netherlands in the 1990s and we drove across to denmark and germany and france and i don't remember you know having more than half a dozen insect splats on windscreen and um i think that is really telling that is really showing the vast decline in numbers and what the problem we have got with things like pollination that we didn't recognize until about 20 years ago so intensive agriculture has meant um not only use of pesticides and herbicides but high nitrogen fertilizer which that makes the grasses and the weeds like nettles and docks dominate a lot of wet meadows were drained so species that lived in those environments have declined as well old fields were oh dear i'm sorry <clears throat> old fields were dug up and reseeded with foreign species like italian ryegrass which is no good for our insects our native insects a lot of butterflies especially the brown butterflies caterpillars have to feed on the old-fashioned grasses and hedges were removed to let machinery in and what i know sorry <laughs> um hedges were removed to allow bigger machinery in and of course hedgerows are really important for insects as well so these are some of the things that we've got to try and think about with the the new policies about paying farmers for encouraging wildlife rather than producing food um we're desperately hoping that it will include a lot of these issues but um i've yet to see a lot of evidence of that it'll mean paying farmers to do things that we're not used to um, valuing before but we really need to do that now and hedgerows are often the last refuge of the wildflowers that the butterflies and moths and uh, a lot of bees rely on here's a like just up the lane from where i live near whitford near hollywell in flintshire and this is taken in early may and you can see there's red campion in the foreground white stitch work then there's greater celandine and bluebells later on there'll be bird's foot trefoil along the verge and there'll be um, hedge parsley along the back and nettles as well and these are all useful for insects um, which is great but um, when the council mowers come along um, they do this thing often of just mowing in one meter from the edge which is fine if you've still got um, plenty of verge left at the back like here but quite often on our north wales hedgerows this is what happens because we've got steep banks and they turn the mower on its side and they just scrape everything off and doing this in may is the worst possible time to do it because that's when butterflies are laying their eggs and feeding up before they pupate and fly away in june and july um, it's also disturbing the ground where bumblebees and solitary bees are trying to nest um, so you know we've been talking to councils for years about this and we are making some progress now but what happens is that the staff change at the councils every few years and they get letters from people complaining about you know why haven't they tidied up the verges in their village and so they um, sometimes start all over again getting the contractors to go out 
earlier to do it um, so we have to keep the pressure on them so if you see you know this sort of thing too early i mean we're not saying you never cut verges obviously you have to cut it especially up at junctions um so you can see the traffic that's the point of it but um it, the there's really not a good time to do it but once a year is enough and probably the end of june is the best time to do it when the first generation has has already pupated and and flown of most species and these are some of the wildflowers that you find along the edges of the roads um, if it's not constantly cut um, bird's foot trefoil this lovely little yellow pea family flower and red clover and these have the highest protein content in their pollen of just about any plant so they're really important for bees bumblebees as well as butterflies um, for foraging in the early summer and if we have a wet summer um, these bees that don't make honey have to go out and feed every day and if they can't find plants like this they simply die out so this is a, a really important plant which you can grow in the garden and in the lawn quite easily um, luckily the it doesn't mind being cut off at ground level it doesn't mind being mown because it grows from a very short growing point like the daisies do so it will grow and flower again now i'm going to start telling you how to recognize the five groups of local butterflies we've got and the first group or family is the nymphalidae and they're commonly called the venesids and we have six species of those then there's the skippers four species of those the whites six species the browns eight species and then the lichenidae which are the blues and coppers and hair streaks so that's a bit more varied family so we'll start off with the the commoner ones and see how you get on oh yeah mark has mentioned my id chart which this is like you probably got the one from the field studies council well, this is very similar it's the same artist but it's just for north wales and i especially have um composed on the back all the diagnostics that i'm going to tell you how to easily recognize all these butterflies and i've also got a flight table for this particular part of the world because what you find is on the butterfly books they're always written by the southerners and their spring and their flight periods start quite a few months earlier than ours sometimes or at least one month with global warming it's getting even earlier so it's useful to have a local id chart and you can get um this from my website which is sevenwells.co.uk and we'll send you an email afterwards to explain um how to get that i've put a special discount on it at the moment so that people doing the course can get it for one pound so the first group is Vanessids, and you'll all recognize these. These are the common ones you see on the Budlia later in the summer because they have two generations and they're the only species that hibernate as adults. So that's why you see them at this time of year, when, as soon as the weather warms up in March, they start coming out because they are already adults and they've just been hibernating in um, dry ivy or in dry buildings. And You've got the red admiral which has got um, white epaulets on the top of the wing that's the thing to look out for you've got the peacock on the right hand side i don't know i can use the cursor here can't i there we are the peacock is our only butterfly with these big circles on the wing um, often with blue in them so that's why it's called a peacock like the peacock's tail then we've got the small tortoiseshell which has like tiger stripes black and yellowish or white along the leading edge which is the easy thing to look out for or look out for this orange over the rest of the wing which um, the others don't have quite so much of we've got the comma that's quite orange but it's got these also got these dark bars along there so you might mistake that for a tortoiseshell except look for the outline you see the comma is the only butterfly we have that has this really indented scalloped outline so that's the one thing to look for to recognize that and then we have the painted lady which comes over from flies from north africa 
and comes the only one that flies any long distance and comes over from Europe in the later summer and that's more of a blotchy pinky orangey colour all over. And the habitats you find them in are gardens with lots of fl different flowers. They like scabious, they like um, wild geraniums, they like uh, knapweed later in the year. So lots of open flowery places, parks, and the larval food plant is usually stinging nettles. So this is one of the ones they tell you you have to grow stinging nettles for butterflies but actually there are only four species which feed on stinging nettles so you don't have to grow stinging nettles there's still plenty of those in the countryside now we're on to the family of skippers you probably won't be so familiar with these and you might think they are moths if you see them these two at the top are the most common ones you see in gardens the large skipper and the small skipper the large skipper comes out first and sort of well, it used to be about sort of late June. It's coming out earlier and earlier now with global warming. Um, so you might even see it in late May, but certainly in June, you'll see large skipper first and then later the small skipper. And the characteristic thing about these is that they have these sort of triangular wings with the inside wing up at sort of 45 degrees from the body. So a bit like a Dakota aeroplane. Um, but they're quite small, but they are orangey brown. And the difference between them is the large skipper has more dark brown on the wing with orange blotches, and the small skipper is all orange, orangey all over, really. There is a size difference. Quite a lot of butterflies have a large and a small um, version, but if you don't actually see the two together, you, it's difficult to tell the size difference. So don't necessarily look for that. Now these two at the bottom are much rarer. The dingy skipper you may see, especially on brownfield sites, both of these actually on brownfield sites, they like gritty, um, dry, bright, whitish sort of areas where they can get their body temperature up um, by sunning themselves on reflective areas like that. The dingy skipper has brown sort of lacy pattern on it it's a very sad name really it's not dingy at all it's really quite pretty when you see it and the grizzled skipper is almost dark black with these white spots so quite distinctive but now very rare and um well the best site for it in north wales used to be where they've now built the prison on wrexham industrial estate so um, butterfly conservation are running a long project to try and get it translocated into other parts of Wrexham industrial state, but it's not doing very well. So this is the thing with rare species are rare for a reason that because they're very fussy about the sort of habitat they can live in. So trying to create a new habitat for them um, when one's been destroyed is, is very difficult sometimes. And these are the larval food plants for the large and um, grizzled skipper and the dingy skipper, especially. The large and small skipper also are some that feed on these old fashioned meadow grasses, which have been banished from farmers fields. You know, we've lost something like 98% of our old fashioned meadows in Wales since the war. And so um, pre pre preserving those on our wildlife reserves is really important. The grizzled skipper also um, feeds on barren strawberry and here is barren strawberry it looks like a strawberry plant the flowers even look like a strawberry plant but it doesn't have strawberry fruit hence its name barren strawberry and the way to tell it is that the the tip of the leaf isn't as pointed as a real strawberry it's got a kind of truncated tip to the leaf also the petals have more division between them you can see the little green sepal shows between the white petals of the flowers. So that will be a good habitat for grizzled skipper on a brownfield site if you spot those. And this is another one that it feeds on, Tormentil. You can see it's the same family. It's actually the Potentilla family uh, with four petals and similar leaves. Now we're on to the white family. Now these are of course the most common especially the large white and the small white, which people tend to call cabbage whites because they feed on our brassicas, 
that we grow in the garden. But of course, they didn't feed on human bred brassicas in uh, millions of years ago. They, they fed on wild cabbage plants, of which there are quite a number. So they can still live in the wild on a lot of different flowers. I'll show you in a minute some of the ones that they can use that you can grow in the garden, as well as cabbages. This is the large white and this is a small white. Again, there's a size difference, but you don't necessarily see them together. And um, these fly, oh, I don't know, with these mild winters now, these fly for a good part of the, the year. See, not all butterflies fly all summer. They have their flight periods when they are adults. But um, some of them, like the large white and the small white, go on for months. And the way to tell the difference, I found the easiest way, is the black tip of the wing on the large white comes further down the side of the top wing than on the small white, which has a little black tip on the top wing there. They also have these black spots on the inside wing, but these vary between uh, male and female. And also there are different whites coming in sometimes from Europe. So I can send you some information about those which have these different black spots. So the main thing to look for is these tips of wings. And um, another one that you'll see very soon now, any day now in April, is the orange tip butterfly. And this is very similar to a small white, except the male will have an orange tip, but the underside of the wing is patterned with this mottled green pattern. Uh, whereas the large white and the small white just have pale yellow underneath. You also see the green veined white, that's very similar to a small white on the top, but underneath it's got these dark veins. So you need to wait until some of these butterflies settle to see the underside of the wing or get a photo, a quick photo of it to help you identify which one it exactly is. Now this is a beautiful yellow butterfly with these beautiful points on the wing called the brimstone. And that is quite common in the rest of the country, south of here anyway. Um, but it's quite scarce in North Wales because its larval food plant wasn't traditionally grown. And that's the purging buckthorn or the older buckthorn. And um, it's not the same as the sea buckthorn. Although I have heard that in Europe it can feed on the sea buckthorn as well. So um, this is something that we can do. We can plant on reserves and we can plant in gardens to encourage the caterpillars to come. This butterfly will fly for about 15 miles to find a buckthorn in sun to lay its eggs on. So it can come across from Cheshire sometimes. And we really need to just plant more of the larval food plant for it to lay its eggs on so that we'll have more of them in North Wales. And this is also a member of the white family, but it's not a native. It can't overwinter in this country. This is the clouded yellow, and it's a much more orangey yellow than the brimstone, and it has these darker spots on the underwings. So um, that's something that you might see in about August. And these are some of the cabbage family that you'll find attract all these white butter white family of butterflies. Honesty, which is a lovely plant to grow, um, which flowers in April. March and April. I've got some in flower now, actually. Um, and they, they love to nectar on this. They will lay eggs on it sometimes. Um, this is the one of the favorite food plants of the orange tip and the green vein white garlic mustard or Jack by the Hedge, which is not the same as the wild garlic. Um, it does have a very slight oniony taste, apparently. Um, but it's quite a pretty leaf and flower. And then Dame's Violet, which is scented and grows in these frothy masses of purple and pink and white. So a very nice um, garden plant. And they'll all uh, attract butterflies in the white family, which will nectar on them. Now we've done the whites. Now we're on to the browns. These, some of these are quite common, like the meadow brown here, the top right. This is the female meadow brown with an orangey patch there and a black eye. 
and this is the male meadow brown which is just a kind of dull brown all over um, without the orange patches now these are very common in late june again the caterpillars have to feed on wild grasses and um, so you'll see them in field areas especially and um, then a bit later on june july you'll see the gatekeeper now this is very common in north wales but it's all entirely absent in northern ireland for some strange reason it's also beginning to get up into scotland i believe it's not very common in scotland either um, this can be mistaken for the meadow brown but what i always say is to look for more orange on it basically if it's got a lot of orange on the under on the under wing the lower wing or generally orange all over then it's going to be a gatekeeper with a thick brown border around it people in the books they say look for the spots the little white spots in the eye there are two on the gatekeeper and there's only one on the meadow brown but i find if they're moving it's quite difficult to see that difference um so i would look for the orange all over and the, the border um now these two are quite scarce the wall brown is now found on again sort of brownfield sites on sand dunes near the sea it's migrated there but i do sometimes get this in the garden um and the way to tell it is um with looking at the underwing again it's got like a fish scaly sort of grayish uh pattern on it and then it's got round spots on the underwing which none of the other brown butterflies have apart from the ringlet but you'll see that on the next slide that's a different color and then the grayling is also now only really found on brownfield sites or on sand dunes and it's got this grayish under wing but it hasn't got the circles on it so that's how you tell the difference between those now we do also get speckled wood this is this is the other common brown butterfly that you'll find in gardens now it didn't used to be at the beginning of the century it's done very well in the 20th century for some reason and spread all over the place and that's got these large white spots so that's quite distinctive um, the ringlet has a number of rings on the underside but not the top side and these are quite distinctive white rings with a black inside and a white dot inside that but it's just plain brown on top these the small heath actually has become more common in the years i've been doing this um, in gardens this is an orangey but but butterfly just plain orange on top with gray furry looking underwing and a little black dot right at the top so look for orangey brown with no features on top and a little except for a little black dot and that will be a small heath the large heath is only really found on heaths as still and it feeds has to feed on cotton grass and um that is larger grayer furrier but you really won't see it unless you go to two you won't because that's only in very special habitats this is just to remind me to tell you about the flight periods you see different species fly at different times and on the id chart you'll be able to use that as a help to identify the butterfly because for example if you see a blue butterfly in um well this time of year march the only thing it can possibly be in north wales is a um holly blue uh, because the common blue doesn't come out until used to be the beginning of june now it comes out in may but it, it certainly doesn't come out in late march or early april so um that's just how something you can tell which butterfly you're seeing by when it's flying now we're on to the hair streak family there's just three of these in north wales the um purple hair streak is a beautiful purple when it opens its wings but very often you'll just see it underneath with this grayish brownish boring color um, and that lives up in the tops of trees with the, along with the white letter hair streak 
tends not to come down to flowers. So people think it's not around. Um, but if you look in the tops of trees, it will be getting its sugar from the honeydew, from aphids on sycamores and other plants like that. Um, the green hair streak lives at ground level and it's our only butterfly with this really vivid green, shimmering green underneath. And it does tend to always settle with its wings clamped together. So you see this, it's just a plain brown on top. And that feeds on bird's foot trefoil or on um, bilberry in marshy areas. And the white letter hair streak is um, scarcer now than it used to be because the caterpillar has to feed on elm trees since dutch elm disease it's got scarcer but it is um, managing to feed on witch elm and regrowth from old english elm so this is quite a, a nice one to find it's called white letter hair streak because it's got this white w on the underwing and this orange band and these are some of the trees that it needs this is the old english elm which was so badly affected by a Dutch elm disease in the 70s and 80s, but is now coming back from the old roots. And it's got um, quite coarse, small leaves. And the main thing about elm trees is the leaves are asymmetrical. So one side comes further down the stalk than the other. You can see this more clearly on the witch elm here, which has bigger leaves. You see one side comes further down the leaf stalk than the other, and that's classic elm. So it seems to be able to feed um, the, the white letter hair streak and the brown hair streak seem to be able to feed on a number of different elms, including ornamental elms. Um, but don't confuse it with hazel. This is what you see in the hedges a lot this time of year, just coming into leaf, and it's not an asymmetrical leaf. The leaf comes down and joins the stalk at the same point. So um, that's just a comparison between different leaves you might see in the hedgerow. Now we're on to the blue butterflies. Um, these are, like I say, the only ones that you see in North Wales really um, are the common blue. Here's the male and here's the female. She's quite brownish, with, but with some blue near the body. And um, the holly blue. And that's a nice pale blue underneath with no orange spots. I'll show you the undersides in a minute. This um, small blue we think is extinct in North Wales. There have been no records in living memory, but it is in South Wales. So if it starts coming up this way, uh, it needs kidney vetch for the caterpillar to feed on. And there's lots of that on the reserve at Cly near, um, near Wrexham and various limestone areas in northeast Wales. So it could come up this way again if it's moving with global warming. And you've probably heard about the silver studded blue. This is our real special great orm endemic species because the female, here is the female of the great orm carnensis race of the silver studded blue. It's the only silver studded blue known in the world i think which has blue on its wings on the top surface so that's quite a special thing to see um, but you won't see that anywhere other than the great orm or greigvaur near prestatin or um Handilis, where it's been translocated by scientists who are studying them it can't fly more than 30 meters from where it emerges so you won't see it outside those special habitats but you can get uh, common blue if you grow bird's foot trefoil in your garden and you can get the holly blue as its name suggests it needs holly and for the second generation it needs ivy in the garden you've also got something else in the blue family which doesn't look blue at all this is the brown argos which can look very similar to a common blue female except these orange chevrons go right up to the top and I'll show you the underside in a minute. It's a slightly different. And we've also got the small copper, this bright orange butterfly, which is pale blue underneath. And have a look underneath. Here we are. Here's the common blue underneath. See, it's got these red pointed spots all the way around the outside of the underwing. 
and then it's got like a circle of black dots with no dots in the middle. That's how you tell a common blue. Holly blue has absolutely no orange on it whatsoever. It's just pale blue. So that's easy if you can get the underside. Now the silver studded blue looks very similar to the common blue from which it no doubt evolved in the long distance past. It's um, also got these orange chevrons around the edge, but it got a little silver stud, a little silver spot just there. Sometimes it doesn't though. So you look at these black dots and if they don't make a complete circle like the common blue does, then it's a silver studded blue. You see they are more irregular, the dots. Now here's a Heathland race of the silver studded blue, not one from the Great Orm. And you can see this one's got um, more silver studs on it, which they sometimes have. It's got a much darker orange band right the way across, and it's got much bigger dark black spots on the underside. So again, it's different from the common blue. Here's the common blue with its small little dots in a rough circle around the edge. And um, the brown Argos also has the orange chevrons around the edge, but you see it's got these groups of two black dots, especially at the leading edge here, it's got what they call a figure of eight with two dots close together, which none of our other blues have. So that's what to look for to make sure if it's a brown Argos on the underside. Small blue, just to be complete, it's very similar to the holly blue underneath. You see it's just pale blue, no orange at all, but it has a regular pattern of dots, and it, but it's quite greyish on the top surface. And here is the habitat on the Great Orm where the silver studded blue special race lives. And this is the larval food plant, the rock rose, that the caterpillars have to eat. But it has a very interesting life cycle like a number of blue butterflies in Europe have where I, my last next slide is shows the flower that the leg, eggs are laid on, that it starts to eat, but then it puts out a pheromone and a sugary solution, which attracts a particular species of ant, which um, seems to think that it's one of its own grubs that's escaped from the ant's nest. And they drag it down into the ant's nest where they feed it sugar. And it's kind of like, a a symbiotic relationship. The uh, butterfly is protected from predators by being in the ant's nest and the ants um, get a sugary solution from it and it can pupate. This is the pupa now of the silver studded blue inside the ant's nest and it will fly out from there when the weather is suitable. And you can record butterflies um, very simply. You, some of you might have done this already. There's a special butterfly count at the end of July, beginning of August every year. And you just need to go to a special dedicated website called bigbutterflycount.org. And you can print out the ID chart here. It doesn't ask you to identify all the rare butterflies. It just asks you for some of the common ones. And you can just spend 15 minutes in your garden or on a walk and write them down and then go back to the website and put the results in. And that um, is now done by over 35,000 people every year, which is a fantastic data set for the scientists to use to see how our butterflies are faring. And just need to talk to you a little bit about some of the wonderful rare butterflies we have in North Wales. We have these fritillaries and they have this characteristic orange back background to the wing with these black or brown squarish markings on them. So they're fairly similar and it's tricky to tell the difference between some of them. We have a our only reserve in North Wales, especially for this pearl border fritillary, which is the rarest one up in the top left hand corner. Um, and we also have a, quite a lot of small pearl bordered fritillary around other areas, often in wet areas in forests like Clokinog Forest or um, in um, sort of boggy patches um, around the area. So you need to tell the difference between the two of these. 
and we also have the silver wash fritillary very occasionally which can fly a long distance it's our biggest native butterfly it's recognizable by its sheer size and by having these long black streaks down the top of the wing rather than so many black squares and the dark green fritillary is another one which you may see around limestone areas or around gardens near limestone and this is a much more orangey butterfly and it's got green patches when you see the underneath i'll show you the underneath in a minute it's got a lot more green on it the marsh fritillary is our our rarest general butterfly it's rare all over europe now um, and it has much more uh, sort of regular bands of white cells and orange cells on it than the others and here are the undersides so you can tell the difference our um, reserve is called earth rocks and it's near Rithin. and um, this is where the pearl border fritillary lives the only place it lives really in north wales now it's called pearl bordered because it's got these lovely pearly cells along the edge of the wing and it's got this one single big pearly cell in the middle whereas the small tortoiseshell also has a border of pearly cells it also has the big pearl in the middle but then it's got more pearly cells across the middle of the wing it's also got a bigger black dot near the body than the pearl bordered so that's how you tell the difference between them but you're only likely to see the small pearl bordered if you're out and about anywhere in north Wales. if you're not actually at the reserve now the silver washed is um quite different underneath on the underside it's got this really silvery wash over a greenish underwing that's quite distinctive and the dark green fritillary has got this as you can see quite green patch on the underwing and the pearls are much more circular and generally distributed and this is what they all have to feed on a common dog violet and you tell the dog violet because it has a white spur it's got this typical violet flower of all wild violets but it's not scented and it has um, a white instead of a violet colored spur and the uh, leaves are quite pointed and we've done a lot of work since 2000 when we bought the reserve near Rithin at Earth Rocks and you can find it on the butterfly conservation website they've got a new um, guide out for it now which you can find on the website um, and we've worked with volunteers to clear the scrub there so that we've opened up the area for more violets to grow and this is the success of our efforts we bought the reserve in um, about 2000 the year 2000 and we started doing scrub clearance on it that winter um, the pink line shows the farmers fields next to the reserve which have the same habitat but on which no um, management was done this is where we started doing the management there were only as you see very small numbers of small pearl bordered fritillaries seen in the years before um, as soon as we started the clearance the next year we had a huge increase in pearl bordered fritillaries and it stayed up at these levels around 100 seen most years now last year actually the count was very low but then because of lockdown we haven't been out counting them we're um in the last couple of years so much so this is really quite encouraging that if you have the right sort of management and you understand the life cycle of the butterfly you can really make a difference whereas you see on the farmer's land next door they've nearly died out altogether um there's necessity of recording i'd just like to say why we so need people to be able to recognize and identify species and send in their records um, because you identify species in decline you're assessing the impact of environmental habitat practices like we were just talking about um, it's very useful for climate change research and um, also the impact on other wildlife because so much other wildlife has to feed on caterpillars that um, the you know even if you're not interested in butterflies you can appreciate that the populations of insects is important for other wildlife to eat and of course for pollination 
and it helps us um we can only press upon government agencies to help us with the right sort of conservation measures if we have accurate data to provide for them and this is a casual recording sheet you can get from me i can um, send you a paper copy if you would like one or um, i can send it to you on email and you can print out your own sheet whenever you go for a walk you can just take it with you some people keep it in the glove compartment of their car so whenever they're out they can record what butterflies they've seen um, you can even do it on the phone now there's a wonderful phone app which uh, you can find from um, the covnod website or just go to um, lurkwales.org and you can get this free app on your phone um, it's used for identifying wildflowers and bees and all sorts of things and it also has butterflies on it and if you put your records into that with a photograph if possible because that helps us verify it um, then it will make its way to butterfly conservation records eventually as well um, there are some advanced recording methods that we use on um, reserves and if you'd like to know more about this I just say now just get in touch with me and I'll be happy to um, come and see you or just let you know over zoom how you can do this for us um, to record butterflies it's got to be over 13 degrees centigrade and preferably for most species over about 17 degrees centigrade um, because they just don't have the energy to fly without that warmth um, you need to see them in partly or full sun with no rain and little or no wing because of their large wings they can't fly in high winds and um, a timed count is um, something you can do just one to four times a year and again get in touch with me if you'd like to do a regular count on a reserve or some special area close to you um, a transect is a more um, time consuming uh, recording method that is used on some reserves so again i'll let you know about that if you need to and send all your records in about october when the butterflies stop flying you can send them in online to covnod which is our local record center or to butterfly conservation or you can send them to me and that's why i'm the local um, butterfly recorder for northeast wales and um, then we will get them into the right database and um, joining butterfly conservation is great you get a magazine three times a year telling you about all the work we're doing and um, news of what's happened to butterflies during the year um, you get details of guided walks and talks and social events in your area and um, you get invited to symposiums and um, general learning more about butterflies and how you can help them so um, that's the end of the the talk can you see me now okay uh, thanks down there yes i can see i can see you. that's fine fantastic thank you <laughs> Sorry, I, I rushed through that a bit because i didn't want to get chopped off again i don't know how many people are still with it I think, I think there's very many actually no I, and, and thank you very much for everyone that's um that stayed with us um and and, and it was well worth staying at for I, I i i don't doubt I doubt that people will think that um yeah if you want to maybe if you stop sharing now it might yeah oh, I stop sharing. yes great. Okay. that's great okay okay and if people... oh, so we've still got a few people yeah, yeah indeed <laughs> uh, and if people want to uh yeah. so if you want to to switch on there. I, I do i also do a talk about gardening for butterflies if people want to learn more about that and there's this book which is nearly sold out now but you can get from my website a reduced price all about gardening for butterflies and bees i do a lot more on bees now as well so um mark will send around an email to everybody with details of all these extra things you can find out more from oh, well indeed that's right and and, and a recording an, an edited recording of your of your <laughs> I miss out the middle bit. Question: uh, By all means, uh, put your hand up uh, virtually or 
or other. There's a few things in the chat which I'll come I to. I'm just looking at Jill's. No, there's no, there's no, no hand. No, no hands up. up. Yeah. yeah. Anybody? Anybody with a hand up? Oh, it's one hand up. Oh, hand Prue, up. Prue, Prue, <laughs> Prue. Do you want to? Do you want to unmute? Yeah. Um, yesterday, I was lucky enough to see a peacock butterfly at the reserve in Aberdeen, and I was just wondering what it would be feeding on this time of the year. Yes, well, things like dandelions are really important this time of year. So mm -hmm. again, we're trying to get um, councils to to recognise this and not mow all the verges off because you often see, you know, there's loads more dandelions along the central reservation on a lot of dual carriageways than there are daffodils planted, <laughs> which are no good yeah. for butterflies. Yeah. And um, dandelions are fantastic th this early in the year. And then... Um, the, most of the bulbs aren't much good for butterflies because they don't like getting into tubular flowers. You know, if you think about the large wings mm -hmm. on butterflies, they won't go into tubular flowers and get stuck, whereas bees do seem to be able to use some tulips and things like that. Um, so there are very few flowers about this time of year. Mm -hmm. um, some of the crocus maybe can be useful. Things like albrecia. Um, yeah, it, there's not an awful lot from honesty is just coming out that can be important and then things like hawthorn and blackthorn on the hedges oh, yeah. um, and so you know any flowering trees even maybe cherry blossom so you know a f just a few things that are out and that are open single flowers so that butterflies can get into them daisies even okay thank you very much <laughs> thank you thanks Bri. thanks Bri. thank you uh, Somebody's asked that, do I do walks around these sites? Yes, I mean, we haven't done them in the last two years because of um, the lockdowns, of course. But um, yeah, I mean, we will be doing guided walks around the reserve, around Aethrox Reserve, the end of May sometime. We haven't booked this in yet, but that's when the, the Pearl Border Fritillary is flying. And I can take a walk on the Great Orm to see the Silver Studded Blue. That'll be in, in May as well, actually. It's getting earlier because of global warming now um so yeah we'll have to put a program together and uh do some guided walks there are, there are some walks organized i think ian are you with us ian ian gordon who organizes the events um uh, he usually organizes some, uh, and he's, he's a few... i haven't seen them advertised yet but um yeah no i'm no. i'm here oh you are there we are hello john hello <laughs> interesting talk thank you uh, we're organising uh, a few events. Um, they're not published yet because uh, the, they'll be published in the newsletter when it's uh, issued, um, hopefully later in the spring, hopefully by the end of next month. I think we're aiming to uh, get it out. But just summarising, we're organising a visit to Minera Quarry. Uh, Andrew Graham has... Uh, arranging that um or leading that i should say to see the wasp mimic what time moth, of year? july the 16th oh okay great um we've got a visit to Minith marion june the 4th all right and there's a visit uh, to clannamanek rocks as well to see grizzled skipper green hair streak and possibly pearl bordered fritillary but we're not sure how well it's doing there at the moment okay well that sounds great so that'll be on may the first the one on thunder minute rocks but the details will be published on the the facebook group as well yeah and the website yeah of so course, if you're members of butterfly conservation you automatically become a member of the north wales branch if you live in north wales and then um, you'll get this information or be able to access it. So, um, yeah, I could do a walk around Earth Rocks sometime in the end of May. Right, well, but, okay. uh, I'll liaise with you, Jan, if that's okay, and we'll try and yeah. get something organised and uh, added to the programme, if that's okay. I'll separate yeah. to this Zoom meeting. Yes. That sounds so, good. People know, yes. Okay, that, that, thanks, Jan. Thank we, uh, the North Wales, uh, uh, the Conway Valley branch has also got a walk. I can't think of it. I think it's the um, 
23rd of June, I think, uh, a walk on the Great Orm to look for the silver studded blues. Oh, um, good. Um, going, going, going from west, uh, from west, uh, west shore behind the Toll House there, uh, right down through through the through to the gun site as well. So we might see other butterflies too, lots of other butterflies yeah. too. So that's that'll be on the. Um, they also be in the the, the 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 newsletter that's coming out. Um, uh, will come out probably middle of next month. Um, uh, to, with with events in and lots of other things as well. Um, yeah, and it'll also be on the website of North Wales Wildlife Trust as well. Okay, but I, I, whatever. In fact, if if we do have any dates or whatever, we can can we even pass them on in in the email that I send out after this uh, after this talk, Jan. Could actually come whatever we've got. Just give yes. people the heads up, really. Yes. Um, you'll see. Martin Neal. Hello, Martin Neal is. Oh, Martin's got got, uh, got Martin. Hello, hello there. Um, I've I've only sort of moved into the area in the last couple of years. I'm down um, in the hills near Clanemanek and Welsh Pool. Um, ju just sadly to say, the last two years I've not seen any pearl bordered down there, so it's been, oh. been disappointing. Um, but my question yeah, actually is is really about confused. is about recording. Um, uh, I've lived in Northumberland and on the south coast and different places, and there seems to be a lot of different apps and different ways of recording uh, now I've moved into your area obviously I'd really like to help this area um, I, I do put things into iRecord but is there something that I should help with uh, for North Wales well this is a bit of a problem there are so many different apps and, yeah. and record centers that we're always a bit worried whether they're all actually going to get into the same place at the end so what I try to get people to do is to use our local record centre, which is Covnod. And again, when um, Mark sends out his the, a little the note afterwards, I'll put um, contact details in that for you. Thank because you. and the reason I do that first is because if any developer wants to build a road, or um, you know, if any council is looking to uh, for information about rare species where to not allow building and that sort of thing the place they have to because we're a devolved nation the place they have to go to is Covnod because that's all the records for North Wales it's no good people like butterfly conservation telling me that they prefer to us to use iRecord because nobody in Wales is ever going to ask iRecord for records they're going to ask Covnod so hopefully iRecord and you know the other big recording centers do share records with Covnod but it might take a year or so for them to get there mm -hmm. so that's why I think it's important to send your records to iRecord for, to Covnod first and then um, you know we all sort out uh, butterfly the staff at Covnod are very very good about sharing the records with I record and butterfly conservation and anybody else who asks for them, but sometimes they do have to ask for them first. So um, that's what I, I think is the best method. The phone app seems to actually send the records to I record. So they, I do get those later, but so far I have got them before the end of the year. So, and then I pass them on to make sure that they're, they're in Covnod, but um, yeah, use Covnod. Thanks so much. They, they, very helpful. They're very interesting because they, they have a conference every year. Now, again, because of the lockdowns, we haven't had it the last two years, except on Zoom, but that's that's accessible as well. Um, they have a conference every year in about October, November. Um, and they talk about and they have various speakers who are experts on all different kinds of things from um, birds to bees to um, pine martins to otters to everything all the wildlife in north wales and um and they uh give you a free lunch and it's a free conference and um very interesting about the work that they're doing the research they're doing so that's really a good thing to be in touch with covnod right thanks that's very helpful okay Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Tony. Tony, I don't know if you want, want to ask this question yourself, Tony, um, uh, about Pearl Border at Aberdeen. Yeah. It's, it's, it's... Oh. Yeah, sorry. We, I think we've seen Pearl Border at Aberdeen in the past. I don't know how they're getting on there now. 
pearl bordered i ha they haven't been seen there as far as i know since um oh god at least 20 years if not longer um so i think uh you know we still need to go and look i mean they did used to be there a long time ago i think but um we still have to keep looking for them but i they you see they can't travel very far and the nearest site to them is earth rocks now um which is probably what about like, five or seven miles away yeah, a long way i don't know as the crow flies quite a long way and they'll only fly for about one one mile so um i don't know if they'll ever get there again unless we actually reintroduce them which is what was tried at Hanamanot rocks and seemed to work very well for a few years simon spencer reintroduced them to Hanamanot rocks in about oh 2005 something like that um and they've been breeding there a few years but but i'm sad to hear that they haven't been there the last two years tony used to go there but you haven't been have you I think when I went with him, we saw one pearl boarded, and I, I, I recall seeing one pearl boarded at Abadonna, probably about Do eight you? years ago. Really? But whether oh, I, whether I it or not, you can tell me off. I don't think I did. Wow. I did well, that one. would be exciting. Yeah. We'll have to go and have a look again this year. Again, with global warming, they're, they're coming out so much earlier. In fact, last year, the first time ever one was was recorded and the photograph was sent to me on the 1st of May, which is like a whole month earlier than they used to be coming out 20 years ago. So, um, you know, they are, uh, they are, if it's a really warm weather in April, May, they can come out earlier. So, yeah, we'll have to go another and look point, at that. Another point, you, you, you mentioned talks to, uh, walks to um, Aath Rocks. And the numbers building up of pearl board, and as we've spoken before, I've had that ab there, haven't I? Every time there's been big numbers, the oh, white, yes. the white one appears. So it's worth people looking for. Yes, yes, there's a really interesting aberration with a um, without having the orange background. It's got the same black markings, but it's got a white background. So that's an interesting one to photograph if you it can. Seems to always appear when there's big numbers. Yeah. Three it was quite low numbers time. last year. We didn't get to record them. I haven't been up the last two years because of the lockdowns. No, no, me. Um, but, but a member of staff went up last year, but I think she only recorded about 17. So, but then it, it can vary with the weather. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it needs more people going up more often when they're out to get a proper view of how many is up there. Thank you. Uh, there, there was a Question here. We need to start earlier. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, we need to start in in early May, I think, now to look for them. Hello, sorry, uh, Teresa. Yeah, hi, John. Um, what accounts for the difference in size of butterflies? Like, I was talking to you earlier about the commas that I saw yesterday. Now, I saw one at home here. Um, near Brunerin, which is like what I would consider to be a normal size, quite quite big. But the ones that I saw at Ferry Glen were noticeably smaller. Yeah, it's to do with it's often to do with how much they can eat when they're caterpillars. Right. I know I bred a lot of small tortoiseshells through once, and I forgot to feed them often enough. And they managed to breed through, but they were quite a lot smaller than normal. Um, yeah. And, you know, so that can affect them, just how much food plant there's available. Um, but also, uh, you know, in, in the tropics, they have huge butterflies and, you know, the temperature and the weather affects their development as well. So, um, mm. yeah, I think it's about feeding mainly mm. in this climate. Because I know sometimes it's a generational thing, isn't it? Like if butterflies have more than one generation, the second one tends to be smaller than the. Than yes. The um, yes, they can be depending on how much food plant was around, but um, yeah. they can also be have slightly different features. Like the comma, the later generation of comma have much more 
accentuated um, scallops tend to have, whereas the the first generation don't. So I don't know what why that is, but but again, I think it's to do with uh, what's available in weather wise and feeding wise in yeah. the um, caterpillar period. Mm. Okay, thank you. Oh, there we answered the hand up. No, but there's, there's, one, there's one question which is related a bit to, to recording uh, from Des James. I don't know whether you're still there, Des. Um, he reports butterfly mm -hmm. sightings to the B BTO. BTO, yes. Uh, should you. I, and a lot of people who do BTO bird squares um, also do butterflies, and that is organised by Butterfly Conservation um, for them to do that as well. Or it was in the beginning so i'm assuming that it goes to butterfly conservation directly as well mm. so that's probably fine but i i will check that actually we, 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 had, we, had, we had an issue with this a little while ago didn't we jill where, where, where jill used to put butterflies on the bco garden bird watch uh, and i remember we also put sent them to um to julian uh, no to andrew, andrew graham. graham andrew graham butterflies and he 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 checked with us that there was a he was getting the same record, same butterfly record, twice. You see what I mean? Yeah. So, so that's we, the trouble. Yeah. So in the end, so in the end, we decided we'd only ever send our butterfly records to him, to to our yeah. frames, and not to nowhere else. And then they would eventually go everywhere else from him. If you see what I mean? Yeah. So, like like he sent them to you. That's that's, you, that's, that's the point of having you. a counter. Yeah. Like, that's the point of having a county recorder, really, because they yeah, should yeah. be. Yeah. yeah, but it's very difficult to know, you know, the main database is with butterfly conservation, whether they've got a duplicate mm. or mm. not. Um, but I, I'm not so exercised about that. I think, um, you know, having having a duplicate here and there is not as much problem as not having any records at all. So <laughs> yeah, that's, that's I wouldn't worry right. about that. Too much. No, fair enough. That's good. Um, but um, yeah, um, but Covnod you know should sort that out all my records are kept on covenant so that if anything happens to me or my computers um they're all in a central database there so you know i rely on them to and they've got professional computer staff to to deal with the the data sets okay 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 thanks thanks john thank you um well, there's just one, one question which was way back and i think i don't think he's with us now good run uh, asked the question that I'm just trying to look for again. If you cut in June, he says, will there be enough seeds from flowers left for the next year? Hmm. Well, it all depends on the particular flowers, doesn't it? I mean, the, the thing that I always say, and this is something I, I should emphasize in my talks more, really, is that the one thing that we could do, and this is something the councils could do and farmers could do, is that you don't cut the whole of one field or whole of all your hedges at the same time do it on rotation don't do it every year because a lot of um, insects have to hibernate on last year's growth whether it's the grass the dead grass from last year or whether it's on trees like in hedges that's why we've lost certain butterflies like brown hair streak which hibernate through the winter on um last year's growth so if you come along and cut the same hedges every year obviously you're destroying the the butterfly um so what they do in north wales is they in south wales where they have brown hair streak is they go around the farmers and they ask them to only cut uh, a third or a quarter of the hedges each year and then the next year they do the different hedges and then the next year the other hedges that weren't done the year before you see what i mean so on rotation so that you're not cutting all the hedges or all the fields every year and this is what i do with my meadows i've got four small um damp wildflower meadows um and i don't cut or graze them every year i do them on a two or three year rotation so that i always have two fields which haven't been cut. And the um, fantastic thing about that is not only does it mean that my wildflowers are increasing and seeding, but also that I've got barn owls and kestrels coming in to nest and tawny owls to breed because um, I've inadvertently made the right habitat for 
voles and mice in the dead grass which I leave uncut through the winter that's the ideal habitat for voles to live in and that's the main prey for owls and kestrels so you know it has a wildlife benefit this whole idea of rotation not cutting everything all at the same time that's good thank you that's it yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's absolutely right i think yes yeah. uh, just a quick question from philippa uh, again it's, it's about recording can we use covenod in mid wales but uh Looks like there is a north of here, Welsh Pool, Montgomery Shadow. Yes. Where's the that's, boundary that's of still, the boundaries? Well, of, Covenant includes Welsh Pool, doesn't it? Just, no, just I, I'm not quite sure where the boundary there's, there's also there's a recording centre for Radnorshire, isn't there? There is, yeah. It would be different. Set this, this, this. That's sort of the Mid Wales one, and then there's a different one in South Wales. So, yeah, yeah. Covenant. I can send you the map actually. Yeah. Of, I can. I can send with our um, email that we're going to send around afterwards. I can send you yeah. the map of of Covnod areas because actually it only goes down the North Wales counties. It includes Wrexham. Yeah. Um, but then that. it's just it it's not so much Mid Wales actually. But like you say, you can send them to Andrew Graham, who's the recorder for Mid Wales. So. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, get we'll, to the right place. we'll include we'll include something, Philip, in the email to, to give more information on that. Yeah, okay, that makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't think there's anybody else with a hand up. No, there's no actual questions. I don't well, think lots of good comments. Loz was asking, but I think I think they've gone. What is the name of the site you referred to in or near Fly? Is it Fly? Near oh, Fly. Yeah, yeah. What, what's the name? Yeah. Of the site? Um, what's it called? It, um, oh. So it's not 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 not, not Martha Quarry, no. No, it's no. not. It's not a, a wildlife trust reserve. It's not a butterfly conservation oh, reserve. Right, it's okay. a county council park, and it's called. Um, I can't think of the name now. But anyway, you know, it's on two sides of the road. Allen Waters. Allen Waters. Okay. Ah, Allen Waters know, Country yeah. Park is what it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, well, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's got wild orchids and all kinds of things. Oh, yeah. It's a Den nice park. Yeah. yeah, sorry, De Des is just near, on, on the Yeah, it's near Gresford, so it's like the other. You know, it's a bit further on from Minera. Okay, okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah, there's so many places you could go, and uh, if you if you, you had the time and the energy and the kind of ones to do it to see different butterflies and whatever come to the well, it's, it's nice especially yeah. during um, lockdown periods yeah. if you've got yeah. somewhere that's close to you and yeah. just about everybody in north wales will have somewhere close to them yeah um so it's finding out about those areas it'd be nice it's nice to get connectivity a great thing about trying to get connectivity <laughs> between these sites you know what i mean so that they don't yeah. they're not just sat on a, on a reserve and kind of interbreeding and whatever and they need yes, to yes. kind of spread their wings don't they and butterflies need that opportunity well, to do that. And yeah. most of our species can't fly more than a mile or so so oh. you know they're, they're not going to spread unless there are interconnected yeah. um wildflower areas and yeah. um you know people talk about the painted lady flying all the way from africa and yeah. the, um, the monarch flying all the way from mexico to canada Mm. And and they tend to think that butterflies can do that, but actually they can't. Those are two really extreme cases that don't happen anywhere else, as far as I know. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's that's probably. Uh, I don't, is it Jill's Jill's George, Jill's George, searching through. Jordan's still still oh, here. Okay, and he's commented that small pearl border. They're actually managing at, at Aberdeen. Uh, for the small pearl bordered fritilla, it's a key species that they're managing. The small, yes. the small, yeah. pearl, yeah. not yeah. the small pearl. pearl has been doing quite well in recent years. It seems, to, you know, it's much more adaptable than the pearl bordered. It seems to have adapted to wet, wet area, boggy areas, and um, is spread around a bit more. So, yes, we've got more of them popping up on, on Halkin Mountain near me, in the last few years. So that's quite interesting. Okay. Well, that, well, I think it remains. I think it's, it's just past 12 o'clock now. People must be getting a bit desperate for a bit of a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Jan. That's fantastic. Right. Yes, yes again. Very much. Thank you so much. What I'll do is, I've just before you leave, don't leave just yet. Um, uh, if people want to, to, to put their 
vid videos on and maybe unmute themselves. Uh, everybody can do that if they wish to, uh, or, or just unmute themselves and give Jan a, 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 a uh, a well-deserved round of applause for, <laughs> for persevering all the way through. And uh, thank you very much, Jan. <laughs> Thanks, and I'll, Jan. I'll, 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 I'll send the recording now to an email and link to everything else. Okay. So hopefully you'll have something to, to, to refer to. And if George Jan will put, I'll give you opportunities to buy that, uh, that chart um, uh, at a reduced price, which is good. Uh, <laughs> but, a short, but a short period of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Bye. 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 All the best. Thank you. Thank you.